Can we find a way to work balderdash into the into this episode? Sure, it has to do with my, the, the increasing rate of hair loss that I've been going through. My, uh, <laughs> I, <laughs> in full retreat at this point. <laughs> I no longer have to worry yeah. about my receding hairline. Well, I have, I have it, a hairline. Has, it has receded. <laughs> Welcome once again to Free Associations from the Boston University School of Public Health, the Public Health and Medical Journal Club podcast for anyone who is as confused by the latest health study as I am by childproof gates. So I go to people's houses who still have kids, still have kids, that didn't come out right, by people who have, <laughs> still have young kids and they have the baby proof gates and i can never or, or 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 locks on their cabinets and i cannot get them open i think that they're that, impossible that, that for whole, a normal human being to open i think that whole thing about putting those little plastic doodads inside the the electric socket so the kids won't stick their tongues in them is a very bad idea because i think that that aversive conditioning would be a far more effective way of persuading kids to to be savvy about electricity it's i'm going to disagree with you there i'm going to disagree i'm going to have to i'm going to go what they need is a sharp sharp shock can't you just step over the gates? Oh well, the gates. I sometimes I can, but then if they, it's at the top of the stairs, short. if they're at the top of the stairs, then you fall down the stairs. Oh, yeah. Or, but I can't get the drawers open. Or the worst, my least favorite of all, is when they put them on the toilet, so, mm-hmm. so the gates can't fall so on the, the ground. Kids, well, I don't know what they're. Good, I mean, it could be for dogs, so they don't go in there and drink out of it. But the point is, then you go in there and you're by yourself, and you're in a hurry, and you need an explanation for. How, do you how, know, to, how to unlock the toilet. Yeah. <laughs> That's it, a funny one for a dinner party. <laughs> I find it incredibly <laughs> frustrating. In case anybody was wondering, I am Matt Fox from the Boston University School of Public Health. And I am here with Chris Gill and Don Thea. Hello, Matthew. Hi, also Matt. Also from the Boston University School of Public Health. And guys, can you guess where we are? We're in the Godly Studio well at done. Boston University Medical well done. Center. So guys... New Year's is coming up. It's time to make those New Year's resolutions. And what better New Year's resolution is there than to get yourself some lifelong learning? That's right. And things that go pop on New Year's. I'm confused. Like the Population Health Exchange. Oh, there you go. The Population Health Exchange website is the place you can go. Don is shaking his head. He looks like he's packing up and leaving. <laughs> Way he's more done fun. With this episode. Just crackers and champagne. I'm yes. Just in so much pain. <laughs> the Population <laughs> Health Exchange website is where you can go to find lifelong learning tools, programs, and classes. We encourage you to check it out. It's at www.pophealthex.org. Head there and you'll find this podcast as well as many other population health programs and tools. What was the website again? www.pophealthex.org. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Just a reminder to you that time is running out for you to sign up for the PHX Winter Institute, an opportunity to take some courses that you will find will enhance your abilities to be a fantastic public health professional. The Winter Institute will not be held here at the Boston University School of Public Health, but in fact will be held online, which means that you can do this from the comfort of your own home. The same great programs, better commute, better travel, better everything. So go ahead and sign up for that. We've got courses in story mapping, we've got a course in GIS, and we've got a course in biostatistics using SAS Jump. And you can find out more about all these classes and sign up at the Pop Health Exchange website. You head over there to get more information and get yourself registered. Uh, as a reminder, we'd love it if you go on and give us a rating on iTunes or all your, all your give us what it was. Are you doing uh, Mr. Subliminal? We only need five give stars. Any Do you kind know of, that we only kind of have five star, five star. Fi- we only have five star ratings. We, we have really, nothing less than really? a five star rating. 58 of them. Wow. That's because we filtered out the other ones. So go ahead and give us whatever rating you want. Five stars, five stars. And then uh, we'd be happy to, uh, to receive that. As so, long as it's five stars. Anyway, five stars. So now on to the show. So today in our first segment, our Journal Club segment, we are going to look at a study that we are super excited to talk about, which is a study that looked at whether or not the differences in uh, diagnosis of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, do I say, am I saying that right? ADHD. ADHD uh, is related to age at entering school. Uh, then in our second part of the podcast, which is our deep dive, we are going to talk about uh, a study that, that looks at uh, cl- clinical trial patients' feelings about having their data shared. 
And then in our third segment, which is our amazing and amusing, we will get into some things that have made us laugh out loud, or in my case, have really helped me get through grading season, which appears to go on and on. So we are going to get into an article that looked at whether or not there was a relationship between month of birth and a diagnosis of ADHD. The study was published in the New England Journal of Medicine by first author Timothy Layton of the Department of Healthcare Policy at a school just down the road, the Harvard Medical School. The study was entitled... I've heard of them. The study was titled Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder and Month of School Enrollment. They say it really well in the title, way Mm -hmm. better than I could, apparently. So lots of headlines on this one. Uh, So CNN says in some states, this birth month is linked to higher rates of ADHD diagnosis, study says. And I like that because they don't tell you which month. It's like in the in, when you're waiting, when you're watching the uh, mm-hmm. the teasers for the news and they tell you, you know, something in your medicine cabinet will kill you, but we're not going to tell you which <laughs> until after sports and weather. <laughs> right. All right. Kids born in August are diagnosed with ADHD more than kids born in September, says Science News. Uh, USnews.com says, could younger age at school start lead to false diagnosis of ADHD? So they got false in there. Hmm. CBS News, youngest kids in class may be overdiagnosed with ADHD. Mm -hmm. Um, And then this one, Global Advisors says, a new ADHD study offers yet another reason to stop sending kids to school early. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's what the paper said. I don't think that's what the paper said. Who said that? Uh, Global Advisors. I don't know what that is. That's probably not a. On the A list there. I'm sure. And then Medical Health News just says, getting schooled. (laughs) (laughs) That that tells you everything you need to know. Tells you nothing. Uh, so Don, can you uh, can you tell us what the study was about, and I will sit here and not be super giddy about the fact that I like talking about this study. <laughs> yeah, I think all three of us liked this study. We thought it really was... liked this study. Really liked. Did it. you really like this study? I this all I'm right, going to go right. out on a limb here and say right now that uh, this is my favorite study we have read in any podcast episode so far, and I'm not going to read any more studies because they can't get better. Yowzer. Okay, that's an overstatement. Okay, all right. So I think the reason why we like the study is that we thought it was very elegant and very um, well thought out and um, took advantage of um, data sets to address a very uh, a very um, important question that we think uh, needs to be addressed. ADHD clearly is a is a problem and I didn't realize this but it is it has increased 50%. The diagnosis of ADHD has increased 50% from 2007 to 2012. So it's something that's being more and more recognized and in apparently in 2016 5.2% of 2 to 17 year olds in the United States were taking medicines, mostly stimulants. Um, for ADHD. Um, and, and and the thing that I think is important to understand is that ADHD is a diagnosis based on the behavior of a child. And oftentimes it's based on the behavior of a child in comparison to other children, in comparison to quote unquote normal behavior. And a lot of times parents won't recognize that their child is hyperactive and has attention deficit um, because they're comparing it to only one or two children in the household or maybe no children in the household. And it's once the child gets to um, a setting where there is an quote, objective observer able to compare that child's behavior against a whole bunch of other children that the diagnoses of ADHD seem to go up. So when the child goes to school and the teacher says, wow, this kid is a little bit too hyperactive um, in comparison to all of the other kids in this particular grade, I think this kid has ADHD. And then the teacher talks to the parents and the parents refer the the kid for evaluation. And then the whole cascade of events um, ensues. Now, it turns out that um, there are 18 states in the United States where you have to be five years old before September 1 in order to um, get into kindergarten. All the other states vary. You don't necessarily, uh, for some states, there, there is no actual threshold. So if you can think about this, a child who's born in August is the youngest in a cohort of children who are entering school. And the child that's born on September 1st or September 2nd would be the oldest child in that cohort. And so this phenomenon where you've got a mixture of children of different ages at five years old, which is um, a a period of life where there's a rapid evolution of behavior in in these kids. Big difference between a five-year-old and a six-year-old. Right, right. And so you've you've got this mixture of kids, some of whom are very young, relatively very young compared to the other kids in the the class who um, are um, relatively old. And so what they did was they took advantage 
of a um, a large health insurance claims database where they use de-identified data um, that was obtained that was available on an individual level on over. 80 million enrollees in the United States, and these were data that came from commercial payers and self-insured corporations, to ask the question, do rates of ADHD diagnosis and prescriptions for stimulants, which is the only reason that you would give a child a stimulant, is because there is a diagnosis of ADHD, differ among those children who are the youngest versus those who are the oldest, or those children whose birth month is August versus those children whose birth month is September. And they looked at a birth cohort for two years, 2007 to 2009. All kids had completed um, one year of kindergarten by 2015, and the kids were linked to the parents' location and all the insurance, drug, and diagnosis data. And they looked at this only for the initial anal- primary analysis in the 18 states that use the September 1 cutoff. They use the other states in a sensitivity analysis. And they use ICD-9 codes for diagnosis of ADHD and um, prescription records for um, the prescription of stimulants. And the outcome was a diagnosis of ADHD or um, a prescription for a stimulant or both. And they also looked at the intensity of treatment, which I thought was a particularly interesting analysis where, where they looked at the total number of pills the child was prescribed during the course of the study. And they did a multivariable linear regression on the rate of ADHD and and medicines, August versus September. Um, And and then they they did a um, pairwise comparison of all of the other months in the calendar year. They also looked at rates of ADHD by age. So they they looked at the rates of ADHD in four-year-olds before they entered school. And they also then looked at the rates in the seven-year-olds by the time um, they ended second grade, I guess it was. They included uh, parent characteristics and childhood illness rates. They they did, as I said, pairwise comparisons, um, and they adjusted for parental and child levels of anxiety and depression and OCD and bipolar disease and obesity and diabetes. So they had in their data set 407,000 children who entered kindergarten between 2012 and 2014. And I thought one of the things that was most interesting the, 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 was the, um, a, a table of the frequency of um, diagnoses. Actually, it was a lot, in the, a lot of paper rustling going on here. Yeah, no, there was actually a, a, it's in the supplement. I don't have it in front of me. But when you looked at the rates per ten thousand of a diagnosis of ADHD or or um, uh, prescription of the medications, there was like a monotonic increase. There was a monotonic increase with every month starting with uh, the lowest was for those children whose birthdays were in September. And then each subsequent month, the rate of cases increased all the way through and plateaued around June, June or July. Mm-hmm. When they, when they uh, threw in the, the covariate, <laughs> there we go again, threw in. Stop throwing things. Threw in the covariates of sex, parents, age, chronic disease, et cetera. Um, they found that um, there was a clearly increased rate of ADHD um, among those children who were born in August when you compare them compared it to those children who were born in September. So there were 52 per 10,000 diagnosed um, in the in the August chil- August born children uh, versus 40, which was a 32 percent increase. This was seen mostly in boys, which mm-hmm. I suppose is not a surprise nope. for those of us that have had boys. Um, and that, Or who are boys. Or who are boys. The other interesting thing was that those children, among those children who had a diagnosis of ADHD, those who were born in August were treated for a longer period of time than those in September. When they looked at all of the states that didn't have this cutoff, they found that there was no effect. So it was this artificial imposition of the September 1 cutoff that really was the, the sort of the causative effect for seeing this phenomenon. And just so, can I just get the numbers in here? So you, yeah. uh, make sure you said it, uh, that the difference in, so in August, in the states that have this, this rule. Cutoff. Uh, in August, it was 85.1 per 10,000 was mm-hmm. per diagnosed. Was it 10 or 100? 10. Okay. 85 per 10,000, 10, 10, 85.1. Uh, and in September, it was 63.6. So right. for a difference of 21.5 per 100,000. In states without, there was a difference, 
but the difference was 8.9 per 10,000 and a much wider confidence interval from minus 14.9 to 20.8. So they're interpreting that as no effect. I would disagree. I would just say there's a much, much smaller effect. That because the, the structural, far less precise. the rigidity of the structural barrier is much lower. Yeah. I mean, there, there, there could certainly, I mean, if you enter school, regardless of the cutoff, if you're born in, in August, you're probably going to be on average younger than people in September, uh, yeah, you, you, you're going to because most kids aren't going to skip a year. Most kids are going to be – so even in states that don't have this, you're going to be right. – August is going to be younger than September. Mm-hmm. So but the, There's a much greater tendency that the parents might just say, well, let's hold off and, and enroll the kid next year. Yep. Because of that. Absolutely. Okay. I thought this was a, this was a, this was a fantastic study. I, I, I agree with you, Matt. I was, do, I was, do you was, agree with my, my note that I wrote down here that so says, good. so good, exclamation, exclamation, exclamation? It, it's a great study because it, it, like, it leverages a natural experiment. And mm-hmm. there are so many sort of nested internal controls in this that I th- that thought that they exploded really cleverly. Basically, to sort of rephrase the, the, the argument, there is no plausible biological reason why August versus September should have any in- effect on whether you have ADHD or not. That doesn't make any sense. And so if we're seeing this difference, it's, it's not because there is intrinsically more ADHD in, in August babies. It's because August babies are systematically younger yep. in these states that have this policy than September babies. And because younger kids are like less mature, they're going to have more behavioral issues. And those behavioral issues are on average going to be, you know, have an increased risk of being you know, incorrectly diagnosed as having ADHD. Now, this is all separate from whether kids have ADHD, which of course many of them do. Yeah. It's, it's just I, I, saying that there is a there is a systematic misdiagnosis rate, overdiagnosis, overdiagnosis rate of ADHD based on this artificial structural split, and and we know this because, as Don said, in the non threshold states where they don't have this policy, the magnitude of this effect goes away you know, not to zero, but largely goes away. We also can see that if you look at any other, you know, pairwise comparison of, you know, January to February, for example, which is one of the analyses that they put in this study, there there is no effect at all. Yep. And so it is unique to this one, one structural, uh, you know, selection bias, policy. I guess. They, car- they compared every month to, every, you know, to, to its subsequent month and, and found, found nothing, nothing going on except... Right from from August to September. It's so all really, of, really all of these interesting. things, I thought just, were, were and then, you know, another one which was was a sort of a compelling example of an internal control was the other pediatric diagnoses that they looked at, like asthma, where there's no right. behavioral overlay on mm-hmm. on diagnosis the of asthma. Negative control here. Right. That also was not there was no difference between September going and on August there. babies, and so all of this kind of like really f- kind of comes down very beautifully around this one one particular behaviorally mediated. Diagnosis, yep. and I, I, I was totally persuaded by it. I, I, I absolutely was too. So I'm about to turn into Chris during his amazing and amusing, and I'm going to talk for a little bit. Please do. But uh, I have a lot to say about this. So, so I want to emphasize what Chris said, which is that this this study is not in any way making the case that ADHD is not real. What the case is that there is so there is 63.6 per 10,000 of the population was diagnosed with the condition in September. There could be some overdiagnosis there too, for all we know. But the point here is not to say that the the condition is not real. The point is that there is appears to be overdiagnosis going on amongst the youngest kids because younger kids have less ability to control their behavior, and that appears like ADHD when in fact that for some of those kids that isn't. For some of them, it is though, and 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 that's a really important point. Okay, I love this study. One of the reasons why I love this study is, and this is this is I think we can all agree this is at least up there amongst our favorites that we have done. This for me, this is my favorite. Um, this is an observational study. This is not a randomized trial. And Chris, you said you you bought the 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 causality here that this is mm-hmm. and this is my point that ca- that that really well done observational studies can in fact convince us of causation. And mm-hmm. there's just I mean it's it's so well done. But 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 in, in defense of that, th- this is essentially a randomized control. It's as closest to as randomized controlled trials you can get in an observational study. I agree with you, and that's so. Let's but that's the point here is that observational studies can take advantage of these these natural experiments. So. So we talk about exchangeability here. So exchangeability is the idea that the my two populations that I have, you know, the the, the group that didn't uh, get whatever my intervention is can stand in for what would have happened to the group that did get the intervention if they hadn't. So that my two populations are exchangeable. And the idea here is that if you are born on August 31st 
or you are born on September 1st. It's it's a, a, a essentially a randomized trial, or, or you're completely exchangeable. That that we happen to set this completely arbitrary cutoff. So we we use this idea in HIV research. So for a long time, we have been interested in this question of whether or not it matters uh, whether or not we set a threshold for where your your where you can initiate treatment based on your CD4 count, a measure of your immune, immune therapy. And so we set the marker historically. We set it at 200, then we raised it to 350, then we raised it to 500. That that number is arbitrary. And what I love about these designs is it's one of the only cases that I can think of where misclassification of your exposure turns out to be a good thing because CD4 counts, we measure your CD4 count, but your CD4 count at any given time, it, it fluctuates. And so the measure that we take at any given time is a misclassified measure on average of your true measure. Plus or minus, whatever the variability which is. Which means that whether you were right mm -hmm. above that threshold or right below the threshold, is arbitrary, arbitrary because of the misclassification. You could have been on either side. And right up at that threshold, a person who has a CD4 count of 499 or one who has 500, they are exchangeable. They are, for all intents and purposes, unless there's some manipulation going on, a randomized trial. And so we can take advantage of that. And that's what they are doing here. They've got these exchangeable populations. And by the way, this is the only thing that, that's been shown to be highly associated with, with um, birth months. So uh, professional athletes are much more likely to be the oldest kids in their class. I take this very personally because I was the youngest kid in my class <laughs> and I always hated it. Um, but, but again, you can, you can take advantage of these arbitrary uh, cutoffs to, to assess, you know, get much closer to causation than we can in many observational studies. But just mm -hmm. in relation to that, the, the issue about the, about the athletes, um, it, it's not an uncommon uh, occurrence here in, in, in New England for parents to hold their child back so that they are larger so that they can be more successful on the hockey rink. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know or, that that's a real sports. phenomenon or that's an artifact, what you just pointed out. Uh, no, so 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 it is a. I think it is a real phenomenon because you're right that they can hold them back, but the analysis is by birth month, not by age hmm. entering school. So it, professional athletes tend to be from the the older half of the class. You, you and know, I think it has. By the way, I don't think it actually has to do with ability. It has to do with the fact that we recognize the ability and then we we select for that mm -hmm. at an early age. So if 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 I if I can go back to your HIV uh, example, um, yep. as I recall, some of those early and the, it, these are regression discontinuity analyses. Yeah. Right? So they don't they don't use that term at all in the paper. They do use it in the they do a formal regression discontinuity analysis in the appendix, which is a way of analyzing data when you have these these thresholds. But it, it, in the case of the HIV. HIV, as, as I recall, at least with the 200 threshold, that this exposed some sort of sort of, sort of tragic consequences of the use of these arbitrary thresholds, where um, the mortality rate on amongst individuals whose CD4 count was just above 200, 201. who are you know trivially more immunocompetent than those whose you know CD4 count was 199, but their mortality was worse than the ones who were 199 because the ones who were 199 said you're at the front of the queue. Here's your antiretroviral therapy. No, absolutely, and that's the point. That's how we can measure the effect of right. uh, of eligibility for HIV treatment because the one person on either side, one's going to get treatment, one isn't. It's a it's a random trial and they they essentially took advantage of that um this also reminds me of the the you had an amazing and amusing that you did on the matthew effect yeah which was about i love it of course about uh getting getting the there was a cutoff score for getting a grant from i can't remember it was, it was the, the netherlands netherlands yeah. uh, and they showed that if you are just below versus just above that threshold it has long-term implications on your career so this is to me this is this is um beautiful study it's a beautiful study so so then i the, the, the things so so I started off the study, I read the abstract, and I already I already liked it, but I made a list of things that I thought, these are the ways that they could have made the study better. And then as I read through, I slowly crossed them all off as I realized they had done them. So having a negative control to say, you know, is it, it isn't just, you know, uh, like an arbitrary finding, everything, the picture lines up. We don't find kids being diagnosed with, with, extra, to, with extra diagnoses of diabetes or other things that you wouldn't expect to be associated with the cutoff, uh, but we do see the the diagnosis of, of ADHD. They they did the full regression discontinuity. So they show you that there isn't what we call manipulation of the threshold. So you don't have people, a uh, big bunching of kids enrolling who just uh, amazingly were born on September 1st because people are lying about their kid's age. What that, I mean, you have to throw a birth certificate, so that'd be hard to do. But, you know, they, they show you that that's there. Um, they compared not just 
at the threshold, but they compared other months. So they compared January to February, February to March. We don't see anything. The only thing I would like to have seen was whether there's a year effect. So whether uh, the difference between August and September differs by calendar year as diagnoses of ADHD have been going up over time. I would have liked to have seen that. Um, I also wonder whether they could have also looked for effect measure modification, whether the effect of that cutoff differs by whether or not you have insurance, because I'm guessing that that... That was one of the criticisms I had, is that they excluded Medicaid yeah. children uh, who are on Medicaid. So there's a whole social strata that is not included in this. Yep. So one of the questions, though, here is, they, and they raised this at the end, and I was thinking about this, uh, and I don't think this is what's happening, but I think it is worth discussing, which is, are we sure this is overdiagnosis in August or underdiagnosis in September? Seems to me that it's uh, the former, um, and in part because- I think so too, but when the, why? When the authors looked at the, uh, whether there was a difference in these children, um, when assessed at four years of age, they found no difference. When assessed at seven years of age, they found a, a, a pronounced difference, and 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 to me that that um, implies that it's in part artifactual that it's that it's not a biological thing. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. So 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 the effect goes away over time. Is that what you're saying? Um, you know, or or there was less of an effect. That the effect does not apply to when you try to diagnose uh, ADHD when the child's four years old, but but it is there when well, the child's it's... seven years old. Okay, mm-hmm. okay. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. the, other, the other thing is that the, the duration of treatment for the kids um, who were born in August was longer than right. the duration of treatment okay. for the, the, the kids who were born in September, implying that um, they were treated for a longer period of time, but that it tended to go away. So more of yeah. those August kids seem to fall out of the, quote, diagnosis of ADHD than the kids who were born in September. Yep. When I uh, described this <clears throat> study to my, 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 my wife, who's a pediatrician, um, she sort of like said, yes, 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 I totally buy this. And, and you know, she really liked the paper, too. She made the, the observation, which I thought was, was just telling, that she is increasingly fielding calls from um, often parents, but, but more frequently teachers, about preschool girls who are rambunctious. You know, these girls are usually three or four years old, and they're rambunctious and being referred for an evaluation of ADHD. Um, and, and she feels that that's, that's wrong and that what, what's really going on is that we're pathologizing the behavior of young children. Mm-hmm. And so... Especially, meaning particularly girls. Partic- particularly girls. So we have, we have this sort of interesting situation where we have, you know, girls who are pathologized for acting like young boys, uh-huh. um, and then young boys who are pathologized for acting like young boys, and both of them are leading to an overdiagnosis of ADHD to some degree. Some degree. Um, when, when really what we're looking at, at is in many cases, not all, but in some cases, we're simply looking at immaturity and youthful exuberance. Mm. I, I agree with the last part that, that I think that, that this is a lot about youthful exuberance. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so another reason why I like this study was it struck me that this study has practical implications. That, that this could be a case where actually just knowing this, that spreading this information could actually be helpful mm-hmm. and could change behavior. And, and it just, yeah, I mean, it, so it struck me as, as more than just a, you know, a mechanistic question or a, a at the, you know. At the very least, let's, let's reassess the need for ADHD meds after one year. Yeah, something like that. Sure. I mean, I just think there's, there are a lot of things that you could do. Yeah. Um, the last thing I started to wonder about was misclassification. So we don't have to worry too much about confounding here, we think, because we think we have exchangeable populations, but I always worry about misclassification. Can you have misclassification at least on of the, so we don't have misclassification of the exposure, we don't think. People's birth month, we're probably getting right. Can you have misclassification of the outcome here? Because we're not, the the outcome is not ADHD. It's a diagnosis of ADHD, Mm -hmm. right? We're trying Mm -hmm. to determine. Now you could, you could have misclassification in the sense that it, it simply, it was diagnosed, but it didn't get into a, a medical record, right? And they, they had a way of accounting for that. They actually looked at not just the diagnosis, but they also looked for evidence of treatment. But you could still, you potentially could miss it if it wasn't, wasn't treated in some way. Um, but it just struck me as interesting because this is, this is one of those cases where it's not misclassification of, uh, we're not trying to say that if you had some way to validate ADHD, not just have a diagnosis of it, but validate that diagnosis, then presumably we think this effect would go away. Right. But we're actually interested in, in the diagnosis itself here, and, and that can't be 
Mr. Gold Standard. In the sense that once it's written in the record, it's that's what we're looking for. It could be under recorded. Right. right. Um, anyway, I mean, it's it's the same the same problem we've encountered earlier with like how do we diagnose depression? Yep. How do we diagnose dementia? Yep. How do we diagnose um, yep. you know autism? Yep. So, so, so I think the findings of this study would be valuable to um, to use to educate both teachers and clinicians. Yep. I agree. Yeah. All right. So the last word, um, my favorite line, my favorite sentence from this, this analysis relied on the assumption that children born in August and September were similar both in known demographic and clinical characteristics and in unobserved factors that could influence the rate of ADHD diagnosis. Given that the September 1 cutoff is arbitrary and parents most likely do not systematically plan births to occur in a particular month in preference to another. I like that mm-hmm. too. I think that is Elegant. sums it up pretty well. Yeah. All right. So let's move on. So in our second segment, we are going to talk about a uh, paper that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine by Michelle Mello, Van Liu, and Stephen Goodman. And it was entitled Clinical Trial Participants' Views of the Risk and Benefits of data sharing. And so this was a study in which the authors did a survey of participants in clinical trials and asked them a series of questions about their feelings about the risks and benefits associated with data sharing, sharing the data that gets collected on them in the clinical trial, sharing that with other researchers or the general scientific community, and then asking them based on uh, their assessment of those risks and benefits, where do they fall in terms of their thoughts on whether or not they want to have their data shared. So Chris, can you can you give us a little bit more uh, of a description of what they did and then Give us your take on it. Uh, sure. So this this was a um, a study where they where they assessed uh, a number of individuals who had participated in clinical trials as 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 participants, um, who uh, were largely at one uh, center, which I think was this in Chicago. Uh, Doesn't matter. Anyway, they seven hundred seventy one patients, seven hundred current and recent participants from a diverse sample of clinical trial patients at three academic medical centers in the U.S. Yeah, and so these were individuals who had. Um, Many of them had been recruited through a CTSI, and so they were What's able a to CTSI? A, a clinical translational science institute, which is basically a, a, a research group within an academic institution that focuses on clinical trials. Mm-hmm. And they often engage with pharmaceutical companies to do uh, sponsored research, but not exclusively. And so um, this the, the, the question came has sort of has risen in year recent years uh, in terms of the degree to which we should share participants' data, and and I I think it, it is. Fascinating to kind of go back and watch the evolution of what I would say kind of bogus arguments um, opposing this trend to sharing the data. So what what I mean by this is that a you know you enroll in a study, they collect all sorts of information about you, they analyze the information, and then they may or may not publish that information. But the data have been harvested, and the question is, should those data then be shared with other investigators who can do other research studies and potentially publish those data separately? Even if even if the main findings were published, you could still share the data and ask other questions of that data. Even if the main findings were positive and were published or negative and were published. But often we're talking about studies that may not have been published. And so could there, could those studies be, could those, the data from those studies, even if they were not published, be accessed by the study? You're talking uh, in general here, not not, not Not people in this study. Right. Got it. And so it all sort of gets down to the ethics of what 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 should we do with this information that has been collected at great cost and great effort. Now, if we look back at the the history of the arguments against data sharing, I think this is really fascinating because we can see where where this has gone and where the rear guard actions have taken place. So when this idea was first floated, the complaints were we can't share data because um, you know there there there's nothing to be learned, say from a failed study, and I think that has that argument. That's a weird argument. That, that argument did not last the test of time because okay. there's almost always something to be learned from the exposure to an outcome, even if that outcome is that like the drug didn't work. There's, there's bound to be information like that intrinsically is important to know. There's also generally safety information that can be harvested from exposure to this compound. So there's always something to be learned. So that's not a good argument. There's another one, which is that we we can't share the data because the, the data can't well be understood by people who didn't run the study. And so we're, we're taking out of context and now it's going to be misused in some way. But there are there are obviously safeguards you could you could 
put in place that would ensure that the people who are using this information understood the context in which the information was contained. And so you could mitigate that risk. So I think that is also not a good argument. And now the argument has, has come up that we can't share data because it might harm patients. And this is, this is a very abstract argument, and it presupposes that the patients would also have that concern. And so the authors here and I, and, uh, basically said, well, that, that argument has been made, but the best way to answer that, you know, to address the importance of that argument is to ask Ask the participants themselves. Don't speak on their behalf. Let them speak. Mm -hmm. And so they're, they're, they have this beautiful quote, actually, in the introduction. It says, both sides claim to have the patients in the public's best interest at heart, but not many partisans of either camp have asked patients what those interests are. Are. In other words, let's not speak for them, let's let them speak for themselves. And mm -hmm. so that's what they did in this analysis, was to systematically survey a number of patients who had been in these trials and say, across a range of sort of hypotheticals, like, how would you feel about the data being shared? And what are your concerns? You know, are you very concerned or you have very little concern? And, okay. You want to read what they, what they were? So the... the so 78% of the participants completed the survey. So I think 771 was the total number. Uh, and the outcomes were perceiving the potential negative consequences of data sharing to outweigh the benefits, being somewhat or very unlikely to allow one's own trial data to be shared with scientists in not-for-profit settings, and being somewhat or very unlikely to allow data to be shared with scientists in drug companies. 82% of patients indicated that they perceived the benefits of data sharing outweighed the negative aspects. 8% felt that the negative aspects outweighed the benefits, and 10% considered them equal. So participants in this case identified some some of the, you know, had some concerns about sharing data, but overall felt that the benefits outweighed the risks. I, I think it's important to, um, to indicate that when these questions were posed to these individuals, it was it was in the context of the data are quote de-identified, so that the the re recipient researchers are not going to know the individual identities of of these subjects and these participants. Right. However, with the caveat that if you if you have enough semi-identifying information, there is a theoretical possibility that there could be a loss of confidentiality, but that's a very, very low, um, that's a, a low probability. But the, 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 um, the people that are being questioned were answering these questions with the idea that it wouldn't, wasn't going to be them themselves individually that would be identified by somebody else analyzing data that, they're, that they participated in. Right. So the, 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 the fear of being linked and, I, and being outed in some way that would be embarrassing or stigmatizing um, is, is largely mitigated by the fact that the data sets have been de-identified. But not 100% already. guaranteed. Not 100% guaranteed. It's and true. Never, and never is 100% guaranteed. And, and the IRBs make us put that into our consent forms. So it, it, I think I think it, it, it's, it's relevant to go back and consider the reasons why patients or individuals agree to participate in clinical trials in the first place. And, and that's not addressed directly in the study, but they do cite previous research that address that question. And I'll just put this into the record here, that 50% of trial participants, their, their motivating reason, their primary motivating reason was that they're hoping to have some health benefit, which totally makes sense. Mm -hmm. But 33% cited altruism as their primary rationale for joining the study. Yep. And 16%, you know, were a smorgasbord of other ideas. So altruism is a huge part of this. And so when you, when you reflect on that, and now that, you know, that was why they joined the trial, but that is a separate thing from the reasons why they think their data should be shared, because the data sharing does not have a health benefit to the individuals. Right. Now, now the reason to share the data is predominantly due to altruism. Yeah, absolutely. Um, or exclusively. I mean, there's um, no other reason. Well, there may be, but I, I, I would think it would almost entirely due to altruism. Right. I agree. But the, when, you, when you look at that, the, the one um, sort of statistic, uh, you know, in terms of, pa of patients being very concerned about their data, that was, it was, you know, not significantly higher than the, for the other categories of things they, they asked for, was patients were, 11.2% of participants were very concerned that companies might use the information for marketing purposes mm -hmm. instead of scientific purposes. Mm -hmm. And that one seemed to sort of strike a nerve. Yeah. People don't like that one. But even so, it is a relatively small proportion of the overall. Uh, and, you know, generally, this was not an area of high concern, but it was a higher concern than of the other issues that they I'm cited. I'm actually surprised it was as low as it was, because yeah. I would have expected it to be considerably higher. Me too. Yep. Yeah, so they were certainly more willing to share their data when they felt that the data was being shared with uh, with 
scientists with with government agencies as opposed to making money being shared with with companies uh so certainly not for profit they were more interested so uh clearly to me the message here is when you look at these patients that were surveyed they felt that there was a uh, in fact an ethical obligation to make as much use of the data as possible and i would which, agree is there is there an ethical obligation Yes, I think I, so. I, yeah. uh, I mean, we, we, justice, beneficence, and, and respect for autonomy, right? All three of those we can check off this in terms of the importance of transparency and the importance of leveraging these these hard hard won uh, pieces of information that are are, are are precious. Actually, patients, you know, feel that there's a there is justice in having their information shared with others to help others in a collective way. Even if it is used for marketing or it's used for... Mm, well, that might be the exception. Right. I but mean, I think as a motivator, they would like their information to help people like them. So when we say an ethical obligation to get as much use out of the data, we mean to benefit science, to benefit humanity? To better what, benefit humanity, as, yeah. As, and we wouldn't put marketing in there, even if that meant that you'd be more aware of, of potentially life-saving. Well, I, 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 I'm, not, I'm not clear. I just don't know. What, I mean, the ethical obligation, I don't know exactly where that goes and how far that goes. You know, I, th I, th I think that the, the major funders have already climbed on board this, uh, the, the, this particular idea because um, you are obligated to make your data available within a certain period of time um, after you've completed the study and, um, and had an opportunity to publish your main findings if you're funded by the Gates Foundation. Mm -hmm. um, and the same thing with the NIH. You're obligated to make your, you know, to, to make your manuscripts free, freely available, and you're also obligated to manuscripts uh, freely available. Well, yeah, through open access. Through yeah. open access. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and then there's this a mandate to the report NIH. to really? report the yeah. results of your trial. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. So transparency in terms of trial <laughs> results disclosure mm -hmm. is is I think clearly an ethical issue. Right. Um, not only does it undermine the fidelity of the medical literature because we have select, you know, selective reporting of outcomes, but you know, there, there is also a, a moral imperative that this information is precious and, and it can only be helpful to other people if the information is out there. Not only, not only are you obligated to, um, to make your protocol available and transparent and your data collection forms available and transparent as, and, and after a certain period of time, the data it's you know it's 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 really um, it's really increasing uh, the whole concept of transparency. Absolutely, absolutely. So um, if I put on my epidemiologist hat, do you, do you, or if you put on yours, do you have any issues with this study? That hat is a very small hat on me. Your, yours is <laughs> yours. You clearly put in the wash and shrunk, but the rest of us, what? Uh, uh, not an issue with the issue of clinical data sharing, but the article uh, addresses a parallel. Um, similar question, which is the sharing of biobank materials, mm. biological samples that right. have been put into a repository. And there, I think, not surprisingly, um, patient participants in these studies are much more concerned about how those biological samples might be used. Because you can imagine that there are very important philosophical and ethical overlays to how tissues could be used. Like if you were strongly, you know, um, opposed to stem cell embryo transplants and you found that your some sample of blood you'd been given was now being redirected to Towards stem cell transplants, and you were very opposed to that. You, 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 you know, you would. I think you could be justifiably upset that the data were being that your biological tissues were being used in that way. But that that is a that is a, a, a distinct uh, issue from whether but clinical on, data have been. Well, hang captured. on. So, but why do we not have the same ethical obligation to get as much use of 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 the bio specimens as we do out of the data? Why is it different? Um, I think when it comes to genetic analysis, it, it, it really it really creates a different kind of a landscape. Well, it creates a it creates an additional concern that that information would be used to harm the individual, right? Yes. That, that, but but let's take that out. Let's say that was not a concern. Do we still have the same ethical obligation to get as much use of those specimens as we do out of the clinical data? That's a big if. That's a big if getting rid of that particular concern. I mean, if you know, if 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 you've got access well, to, but the, my data can. I mean, any data on a, a patient with HIV, um, you know, if 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 not de-identified beyond the level at which we normally mm -hmm. think of as de-identified, can be can highly stigmatizing. Be, it could be stigmatizing, and that could be re-identified. We yeah, we have seen yeah. it done in. Uh, there are you know clever organizations who know how to re-identify. Mm -hmm. 
uh, patient data that we think is anonymized uh, and can can figure that out. Why is that? I, why, I, I mean, there's a so my point is there's always a risk. I think the fact why is there not the same ethical obligation to make extensive use of biospecimen data as there is clinical data. I mean, there there is an ethical obligation to do so, but the, this is where the the parameters of the informed consent really come to be front and sure. center. Yeah. And, and I think in people's minds, including mine, that there is a difference between a piece of me that is being used outside of the way that I had agreed that it could be used in a consent form. So, so what? You've now anonymized this and, you know, the picture, you know, you know, the piece of my liver or my skin or whatever, my blood, my saliva, whatever it is that I gave you, it's still a piece of me. And I, and I find it troubling that it would be used in any way other than what I had agreed mm. to. Whereas my response to a survey, I feel much less personal about well, that. Well, a survey, but a survey that contained private information. I mean, detailed private medical information. Right, which is an issue of of, of privacy and, and data security. Um, but I don't feel... Uh, emotionally invested in, you know, the fact that subject 10122, who turns out to be me, it's, you know, this hypothetically, who turned out to be me, had HIV, as opposed to subjects 10222, who two was four, me. 24601. Who, right. Whose who's tissue of my, you know. I'm cultured. You know, my blood is now being used to, sure. uh, you know, justify the creation of a, of a new drug yep. from a company that has bought access I, into this biobank. I, I think one of the, one of the par- sort of cor- corollaries of this is... Um, that working in developing areas, uh, developing countries, like we all do, um, there's a there's the three a of us, we all th- the three of us do not the listeners, right? They um, don't. There's a trem- we don't know. There's a tremendous amount of sensitivity about exportation of biological specimens, and I think in particular around the analysis of genetic materials. And I yeah. think that that there is a fear, which I think is justified on the part of members of the scientific and the health community and the regulatory community in those countries that, that there can be conclusions that could be drawn that may not be beneficial to the populations when doing genetic analyses where um, things could come out that aren't necessarily, uh, that aren't necessarily okay. beneficial. I'm not going to push it any further, but I do want to raise one other issue, which is, is there, do you think there's a chance that, that as well done as this study is, it's not all that, it's, it's not overly, not, not all that, but not overly generalizable that these, um, you know, they, they identified colleagues of theirs to, to connect them to their patients. Fair enough. I can't see another way that you would do this. Um, but the conditions that these people had were, um, Largely diabetes and issues related to nutrition, weight, and vitamin supplementation, things that might not have been particularly controversial. And they nine, greater than 94% of the respondents reported having a positive experience as clinical trial participants. So do we think that, that it is possible that if you were in a trial, let's say a cancer trial or, or um, you know, some genetic trial, I mean, there were some in there, but it wasn't the overwhelming amount of the population, that this people might have more concerns, that people might be less willing to share their data if the issues that they were in the trial for were things that could be considered more ethically controversial. Like a study of Huntington's disease yeah. or yeah. some other genetic anomaly. Yeah. Yeah. I, so I, anyway, to me, this is a great study, and I, I think that, that we are better off for having this information. I'd like to see this repeated in some other populations mm-hmm. just to make sure that we're not looking at an anomaly. Uh, okay, so let's move on. So in our last segment, which is our Amazing and Amusing, we want to highlight some of the things that make us enjoy our jobs even more than we already do. A look at the weird and wacky things that happen in our fields as well as the things that inspire us. So Chris, you want to... You want yeah. to go first? Yeah, yeah. So I found this uh, paper uh, in Science uh, Advances, which is one of the science subjournals. Um, and the title of the paper is called Tracking the Weight of Harkin Harvey's Stormwater Using GPS Data by Milliner and Colleagues. Interesting. Okay. okay. And so the, sub, the subtitle of this is Hurricane Harvey Hammered Houston Horrifically. That's alliteration. That was my edition. 
Right. And so I just want to remind you all that Hurricane Harvey was the second most catastrophic uh, hurricane to strike the United States in history. Second most. Second most after Katrina. After Katrina. So so more the Galveston was, was another? Uh, I don't know I think about Galveston, about Galveston, but this is this is the number two and, uh, in terms of causing havoc. Okay. Now, for those of you who don't remember, Hurricane Harvey uh, hit us in August of 2016. Uh, it migrated for approximately 900 kilometers across the Gulf Coast, affecting Louisiana uh, and in Texas in particular. Um, it was a very slow moving storm. And what, and one of the problems that, that really hit Houston was that it stalled, meaning it stopped moving right. for several days while sitting right on top of Houston. And during that time, it just rained and rained and rained and rained and rained and rained and rained. And so the, the wind damage in comparison with other hurricanes was, was not so severe, but the water damage was totally catastrophic. And, and some, um, I'm not going to call these fun facts, but scary s- statistics, Hurricane Harvey dumped 1.5 meters of rain you know, that means a, a meter and a half of rain per inch of ground. That is an, an unbelievable number. And the, the cumulative amount of rain was 95, excuse me, 93 square kilometers of water. So let's put wow. that in. Let's envision that. A swimming pool, 93 miles long, 93 miles wide, and 93 miles tall filled with water. That is what fell on the Gulf Coast. That's it is, it is an unbelievable number. And the damage was has ultimately come down to be $125 billion, which is not nothing, even in these days. Now, what these guys did in this analysis was to, to um, ask the sort of interesting question of how much does that weight of water, that massive weight of water, actually change the shape of Texas? Change the shape of Texas. Because, you know, you have to sort of envision that the land, you know, the, the earth is constructed with, with a, you know, a, a granite uh, ground table, where, you know, where the earth's crust. And on top of that is, is dirt, you mm-hmm. know, which is relatively spongy and can be deformed. And so they were curious, like with, with a massive water load like this, how much did the shape of Texas change? How much does it get squished by Hurricane Harvey's water? How much does it get squished? So How you much? think of it like a because you yeah, know, it compresses. If, you, if you you compress it, right? There's there's only so much where that weight can go. Some of it can so, soak into the ground, but after a while, you've saturated the ground, and the weight is still on top of that. And Houston is, is a coastal city, so are you saying we're lowering the like we could go below sea level? Right. Well, not lowering, but like that the uh, the, the 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 actual um, depth of Houston, the, the, like the the land in Texas, Houston's squished. To a certain degree, it was pressed down yep. as if you came in and put a, put a giant 93 kilometer by 93 kilometer by 93 kilometer weight on top of it. That is going to have significant deforming effects on yep. the Earth. And they could measure this using GPS satellites linked to satellite stations that were all around Houston. Cool. Uh, yeah, super cool. I mean, and unfortunate, but cool. Um, and so what they found was uh, that the... The net effect was that there was a 21 millimeter depression of... How big um, is that? So about a two, that two in, centimeters. In, how, put, translate that into dollars. 22 centimeters. So two centimeters, uh, Euros, 21 millimeters, $125 billion dollars. Divided by 20, 21 million. It's 21 what's the, millimeters. What's that? Center? <laughs> this is That's a useless statistic. Why do you what's, care? What's that? Why do you care? That's a useless statistic. No, no, no. no. Translate that into, into centimeters. Uh, 2.1 uh, centimeters. 2.1 so centimeters. About an inch. So uh, that's, yeah. Houston was he, the, Houston, the, is an inch Houston was scrunch squished by about an inch. Wow. Um, as a consequence of that's a, Harvey. That's a big effect size. And then they size. could see that, like, you know, initially when you look at the, um, you know, the, the depth of these GPS, you know, relatives to the satellites, which is, can be measured with high degree of precision, they saw that within the, you know, the first week that it sank um, around, you know, by, by a centimeter to two centimeters, depending on where you were. And then over the, the ensuing five weeks, you could see the earth kind of springing back into shape and reforming. And so, so it took five weeks for wow. us to get back to the net total water saturation levels of the pre-Hurricane Harvey period. Wow. And Pretty in the cool. first week, we were the, the runoff, which was, you know, about a third of the water was absorbed into the land and retained. But the remaining two thirds had to go somewhere. And so the rivers were just inundated and, and they were losing about 8.73 kilometer, cubic kilometers per day of water going into, into the Gulf of Mexico. Amazing. Amazing. Mm. That's why we call it amazing and amusing. Incredible. It's always amazing with Chris. Uh, so I'm going to go second. Uh, and I broke broke my tradition here. I normally go amusing. I went amazing this time. Oh, really? Although it has some 
amusing parts to it. Um, yeah, so I went with, I found an article, a scientific article that I found particularly interesting. Uh, the article, I can't even pronounce the, the title th- that well, but I will try. So it is speciation of two gobioid species. Gobioid? Gobioid. Gobioid. G-O-B-O-I-I-O-I-D. Gobioid species. Pedagobius elapides and Pedagobius zon- zonolacus revealed by multi-locus nuclear and mitochondrial DNA analysis. Uh, it was published in Gene in February of 2016. It's a speciation of different species of fish, different kinds of fish. What I found pretty interesting about this was the first author. The first author of this article is Akihito. Do you know who that is? That is the Emperor of, of Japan. Japan. Oh, wow. wow. One name only, first of all. It gets published with one name and one name only. But this is the Emperor of Japan who wow. is an ichthyologist. Is that what you call a fish yeah. person? Yeah, yeah. And I went and looked him up. He's really published, like sushi. published 11 papers. Published 11 papers. And last one, in I think, in 2016. But the, he's in his that, 80s. That is amazing. He is publishing. And he gets to publish under, under just one name. So he's wow. like Cher or... You know, whatever. He gets published under one name and one name only. He is not going to get promoted with only 11 papers. He is not going to get promoted. It is a concern. So So he's not going to be full emperor anytime soon. And and then then you look at the affiliation. (laughs) Stay as assistant emperor. uh, His affiliation is the imperial residence. Oh, wow. Isn't that awesome? That is awesome. It's like when uh, Barack Obama published in in JAMA. Just single author. Just Mm -hmm. wrote his paper. What did he say? Barack Obama. He said you should fund the, the, the ACA. Oh. Yeah. I just thought that was so cool. That is so very cool. cool. I don't know what the paper's about, but I just that was fantastic. <laughs> you did a really good job of pronouncing what are the it. Gobioid fish. I don't know. All right, are they tasty? I never tried one. We should find out. Don, what do you got? All right. Well, I'm gonna um, I'm gonna bring the quality of the discourse down several notches. That's, as, what, we, that's what we count on you for. As I am want to that do. That's why you're here. So I've got an article that was published in the journal Pediatrics and Child Health by Andrew Tag. Wait, Damian, that sounds like a real journal. Damien Roland. It is. Okay. It actually is. Um, and this article is... I can see through the back of it. That can't be a real journal. <laughs> is um, Everything is awesome. Don't forget the Lego. I, that's exactly it. I saw a Lego head through the back of your paper. So um, this everything is... Everything is awesome. This is a paper which tried to address the issue of how do you... <laughs> I can't look at the back of that. Go ahead. How do you? How do you? How do you deal with the possibility that your child may have um, may have swallowed a Lego? And oh. what it was trying to do was trying to get a sense for what is the transit time of a swallowed Lego head. What, a Lego head. So we're Lego talking about head, not small. a block. Right. These are treacherous items. I yeah, mean, yeah. if you if you step on one of these things in the, the worst, middle of the night, the worst, the worst that, thing. The worst, in, yeah, it, absolutely. Oh. But apparently, um, swallowing them also is a concern in in UK, and um, they they reference um, another paper that looked at the time that it takes to pass a coin as being three to five days. And so what they wanted to do is they wanted to figure out what is the transit time for a swallowed Lego head so that they could advise parents how How long long to sift through the stool of their child to try to retrieve the Lego head. Is it to retrieve it or is it just to make sure they passed it? Well, yeah, to make sure that they passed it. I I don't think they're going (laughs) to reuse it. No, No, they just want to be assured that that it's not still in there. Yeah, got it. So they recruited six pediatric healthcare professionals um, they were recruited to swallow one wait, one Lego head. Wait, they had. <laughs> this is not an observational no, study. No, this is an intervention. Right. right. So they got six volunteers <laughs> to randomly swallow Lego heads. And the, and the, Lego. Yeah, and the exclusion criteria were <laughs> exclusion criteria were previous gastrointestinal surgery, inability to ingest foreign objects, or an aversion to searching through fecal matter. Yeah. was an exclusion <laughs> I'm criteria. In there. I'm out. I'm definitely out. <laughs> right. Right. So what they did is they also wanted to standardize the bowel habit between participants, and they developed a stool hardness and transit test, which they called the SHAT test. Uh (laughs) Uh-huh. That's terrible. That's terrible. (laughs) And then they also also determined... what was the... This is not a joke, right? These people really ate the Lego? Yeah, they really ate the Lego. (laughs) 
and then and was then, it uh, labeled? Uh, and no, no, these individuals were tasked with searching through their stool <laughs> for oh. every subsequent bowel movement to, until they science. found. They called it uh, the found and retrieve test. Well, no, it was, it was the found and retrieve. <laughs> Nick is already shaking his head. Found and retrieve time was the outcome. What do you do with it once you found it? It was the fart score. <laughs> <laughs> what journal is this? This, this, is, not a real this is the Journal of Pediatrics and Child Health. This it's a, a real, real journal. journal. Honestly. Oh. Honestly. So they found on balance that the average transit time was less than the transit time for a coin. The, the average transit time turned out to be the fart score average. <laughs> 1.71 days, which was considerably less than the transit time for a coin. Wow. Huh. Now, this is interesting because I, and I they, do, do Lego heads float? Uh, I don't think so. So the, like in the, in the gastric juices, they wouldn't like just float around in the, in the gastric soup and not, not pass, pass into the intestine? No, they passed through the pyloric sphincter and the anal sphincter, so there was not a problem. Huh. There was one individual, however, <laughs> so, so there, were, there were seven individuals who swallowed Lego heads and they retrieved six. Oh. And for the seventh individual who happened to be a male, um, he continued to look <laughs> through, the, look, to look for the Lego head for two weeks. Whoa. <laughs> so I love the way they, uh, they, they end this, <laughs> uh, the, their discussion. They you say, know what this smells of ascertainment <laughs> bias. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. <laughs> I think that that is a high point. No, it's a low point. <laughs> oh. that's, that's, we we well, have to come to the bottom of our... Back our ways into this. Nick's going to have to be careful with this one. So oh. they say that there are some limitations to our study. The population study should not be, could not be blinded to the study outcomes as we felt it was unfair on the author's partners or colleagues to search through their waste products. We also recognize that the stool hardness and transit score is not a perfect surrogate for underlying bowel pattern, but the fact that the participants can shat themselves <laughs> without specialist knowledge makes it an inexpensive tool. Science, you know, it the march <laughs> is inexorable. We just have to find out. <laughs> and there's Matt's phone going off. All right. And with that, you have wasted another perfectly good hour. <laughs> <laughs> you have yet again been dragged that to is, the depths of depravity. That is the end of our program. So if you've got Thank any God. feedback on this or any other episode, or you want to suggest a topic for us to take on, you can tweet us at, at PopHealthyX, or you can tweet me at, at ProfMattFox, or Chris at, at ID.Gill, or Don at, at Dethia1, or you can find us on the Population Health Exchange website at www.pophealthex.org. We want to thank Leslie Talali and Director of Lifelong Learning at the BU School of Public Health for supporting the podcast, and Nick Guler for hours and hours and hours of sound and editing. And patience. Thanks for joining us. We hope you've enjoyed it, and we hope you will download our next episode. <laughs> <laughs>